I think we jump right into it. I mean, I know it's kind of a, it's a sore subject. We all we all use them, and it's it's got a lot of, lot of implications to it. But let's let's jump in it. I mean, you've yeah. got some really yeah. interesting data to talk about. It. And, and I don't want this discussion to sound like this is the silver bullet, that this was the only thing, or that maybe this is even the only solution. But I think it's deserving of discussion. When uh, motion wing decoys first hit the scene uh, in the very tail end of the 1990s and the early 2000s, there was considerable discussion, uh, Larry, amongst the state biologists and even at uh, Fish and Wildlife Service level of questioning whether this new toy, this new, this new thing, was going to have any impact on the population at all. And for those of us, Jim, you can comment. You can mm -hmm. comment when you first started using it. Uh, it was developed in California, uh, and the first they were very crude and rudimentary. In fact, some of them were just a piece of metal. Had the goal post on top. Goal post, and then another one I saw. They actually used an electric drill, and they had they had a little piece of metal, and they turned it sideways. And so this guy at the end of the duck line, he went Rrr, like this, and this little thing spun around like this, you know. But that fall, when I finally dug it out with a couple of buddies and I. And we started using it, it as like, oh my God, what in the world is this thing? Because in the early days, I mean, it was phenomenal. I mean, think about it. those birds have never seen, and biologically it made sense. Those of us that have flown and visual just, communication. What gets your or, attention? Or have yeah, collected please. hundreds of hours of time activity budget data for a postdoc. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. what, what's the first thing you see to key you off the ducks when you're flying? Mm -hmm. Wing flash. Yeah. Yep. Flash. So it's like brilliant, you know, this genius, you know, the, this kid. Anyway, bottom line was this thing shows up on the scene. Uh, it took a while for it to even be known. It took a while for it to be accepted. Uh, data from Minnesota are probably the best data set we've got that I think in 2001, about uh, less than 10% Minnesota duck hunters surveyed had uh, heard of it, seen it, or used it. By 2002, it was up to 25%. By 2003, it was up to 50%. By 2004, it was 80% of the hunters in Minnesota had one were using it. So within three years, it went from 10% to 80% of the hunters using it. Part of that was a marketing thing and an availability and new toys that were being produced and they were more available in one thing or another. This caught the attention of the biologists. It caught the attention for a couple reasons. The main one was the science of it. Well, are we actually going to kill more ducks for this thing? Is this going to affect our matrix, right? Yeah. Is this going to affect uh, our regulation process? Are we going to kill too many of them now? So it was the effect on harvest rate. Uh, there were other questions, obviously, that had to do with simple ethics. You know, because honestly, back in time when uh, baiting regulations were put in, that we didn't have the biology or the science to say that throwing out wheat or corn or anything was going to hurt the population, but it was an ethical argument. The early uh, discussions in Forest and Field Magazine later become Field and Stream and uh, having to do with live decoys and with electronic collars and with baiting and so forth. A lot of, to be very frank and honest about it, a lot of decisions to ban them didn't have scientific data behind it to say that it was going to completely decimate the population. We believed it was going to be detrimental, but it was also an ethical and moral thing. And so that was also part of this discussion. Okay, is this in fact something that kind of almost crosses the line, you know? 
of, of whether, you know, we as hunters and we would pride ourselves of being hunters and learning the birds and all that, is this kind of crossing that line? Is this another live decoys sort of thing? Probably if you went out there today and scientifically compared the use of live decoys versus the use of spinning wing decoys, I'm not sure you'd find any difference. And yet we would look at use of live decoys as probably the most awful thing, unethical thing, and yet we put this thing out and turn it on and spin it and we think the world's cool. Honestly, is there really any biological difference? But the point being that the, the people got concerned enough about it, the studies were initiated to determine the effect of it. Studies were done in Minnesota, were done in Canada, were done in Missouri, were done in California, were done in Illinois. Gosh, there's a whole different, bunch of different states. I don't know if Louisiana participated in any of those studies at that time or not. And all of a sudden, they started coming out with the data, with the conclusions. Very, very consistent that, first off, number one, yes, it did increase the vulnerability of the birds. I mean, it was kind of self-evident. I mean, if it hadn't worked, duck hunters wouldn't block, right? <laughs> you know, duck hunters are pretty good crystal. But if Jim comes out with a new duck call, and it doesn't work, he's probably not going to sell them any of <laughs> But if he comes out a new duck call and it works good, they're going to buy a tar out of it. So this thing worked. We kind of knew that, duh. But first, that's the first conclusion, yeah, it did work. Secondly, it worked especially good on young ducks. And you think about it, because a young duck, brand new in the world, he's never seen, never been hunted before. He's never seen any of this sort of stuff before. All he's known growing up, he's only a few months old, is other ducks that are flopping out there and he sees it and goes, oh, oh boy, you know, mm -hmm. buddies are, you know, I'm gonna get some food because I don't know where it's at yet and all that. So the things were especially effective on young ducks. And they also were disproportionately effective on females. We still don't quite understand maybe why that was the case, but it was. Some of the studies indicated that the differential vulnerability was between five to 15 times right. as vulnerable. The Minnesota study in particular showed anywhere to five to eight percent, partly as a matter of time. So, in other words, if you went hunting uh, in Minnesota, or especially early in the season, and you used a spinning wing decoy, you were probably at a five, five X, a five times more probable chance of getting a duck within distance. Now, whether you killed or not was your business, but getting it into a shooting distance, it was five to eight times more vulnerable. If that wasn't enough, a classic study that was done in Manitoba Day by Dale Caswell and his son showed that the increased vulnerability was even greater in Canada than it was in Minnesota or some of the northern states, which kind of makes sense because even more young ducks and closer to home where they've been hatched and all that. And also was very, very clear in demonstrating that in field uses, that the vulnerability was exceptionally high, especially on young females. In fact, this number is going to blow you away. 33 times more vulnerable in a field situation than over water without one. So if you hunted in the field with spinning wing decoys, you had a 33 times greater probability of getting a duck in distance than if you shot over a pothole without one. That is huge. Why do you think all of a sudden now in Canada and you hear about it and you guys that go up there, hunt there, live there can comment on this more than I can. Who, where do you hunt in Canada now for the U.S. hunters that go up there? Dry field hunt. You hunt in dry field. You use a layout line and you use a bunch of spinners and you kill the tar out of them. And if truth be known and you looked in that pile, you're killing the heck out of young ducks and you're probably killing a disproportionate number of females. This is scary. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if we kill this additional number of ducks. Uh, that brings into the discussion about compensation and additivity and so forth. I believe to say that through what Larry was talking about with the AHM, part of the, the, the reasoning was a scientific uh, experiment with, with it. And part of it was to learn, uh, if we could, whether population density had much effect or not, and whether uh, hunting was additive or compensatory. And now after however many years, Larry, the models, and we've got the graphics that can be shown, uh, it's published by the Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, the data are becoming fairly clear that the uh, amount of added, the most, a lot of the harvest from mallards, again, remember this is from mallards, and it also is broken down by age and sex, that uh, the models are indicating that hunting is uh, 
primarily additive and not in relationship to population density. So, if you don't mind, define additive and compensatory. Yeah, the um, that that's a uh, thank you. The discussions even back in the 1970s, Larry Talk started to talk about this with the hunting regulations. Up until really the 1970s, the general feeling amongst waterfowl biologists, and this was not unique to waterfowl biologists, it also was up on game managers, deer managers, turkey managers, whatever, was that when we shot an animal, that obviously that was one less animal that was going to go back to breed the following year, and it was going to have an impact on the production production the following year. And that's an additive. In other words, if you shoot a duck, uh, you're also going to impact how many young will be there the next year. As data analytical techniques started to evolve in the 1970s, questions of methodology and statistics came into play, Larry, and helped me with this, to kind of question that general concept a bit. And the notion of compensation started to occur, meaning that we know that a certain number of animals, again, whether it's deer, turkey, or ducks, are probably going to die every year anyway uh, because of old age, disease, poor body condition, poor habitat, on and on. So what happens if you shoot a duck that was going to die anyway because it was old and going to croak? Then probably that dead duck didn't matter. So that was what we would call compensatory mortality. And so then the big debate started about, well, is hunting primarily additive or is hunting primarily compensatory? Or is it both? And then one of the concepts was there's probably some threshold level, meaning up to a certain point, we can shoot a bunch of ducks and it doesn't matter at all because a bunch of them are gonna die anyway. So what's that number? But if we cross that threshold and we kill too many, then duh, it's kind of common sense. Then yeah, we're going to have an effect on the population. Some may remember, if you're older hunters, we had a period of what we call stabilized rigs, stabilized regulation. So about a five-year window pre-HM, uh, seasons were to be set and to be held constant regardless of population size, regardless of habitat conditions. We were going to hold them steady for five years, and we were going to learn. By God, we were going to learn. Well, we didn't learn. <laughs> it was too short a period of time. Seasons were all over the place. Wasn't consistency, on and on. So then we get to the 90s, Larry, and all of a sudden, smart people said, wait a minute, there's a better way to learn. And this adaptive management approach took legs and part of the rationale with the matrix setting and the season and so forth was to set up a season framework sort of methodology that over time we would learn whether it was additive or compensatory and now the data are showing that uh, population size is maybe less important than we thought it's less density dependent but we do know at least some harvest is added i wouldn't say all of it is and it's probably species specific and this is only for mallards and in the mid continent area so you know for what it is, that, that's, that's the point. So back to the spinning wing decoy uh, thing, then this data started showing up that yeah, this thing works and it increases the, the vulnerability of the birds. Remember though, this was early 2000s, we still had, we didn't know if it was compensatory, added both, didn't matter, whatever. And like this or not, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service, after looking at all the data and all the comments, and there was a lot of letters that are on file from some <coughs> agencies and other, other entities and research groups uh, asking the Fish and Wildlife Service to consider this and consider regulations, the Fish and Wildlife Service decided, no, we're not going to alter the use of spinning wing decoys. If the states want to, fine, but we as the Fish and Wildlife Service are not going to regulate this. So it threw it back in the state's lap. So well, and, and there was, and they, and they specified the reasons for that. And that is that AHM was in place. Mm -hmm. So, so a, an AHM's role is that if the harvest rate increased for whatever reason, whether it was tungsten super shot, three and a half inch magnum shotgun shells, remember those were relatively new at the time too, spinning wing decoys or anything else, if those impacts led to an increase in harvest rate to the point that 
that we had to take action, AHM was in place to take that action. And it actually refocused the argument a little bit by hunters saying, why should we risk having to go to a 45-day season instead of a 60-day season because of spinning wing decoys? And we actually, at the flyway, petitioned the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for a moratorium yes. on the use of spinning wing decoys yes. <coughs> to do a large-scale research project to evaluate their impacts. And it was after that request that they articulated their reasons for not regulating them.